Hello? Okay. Uh, this morning on Dave's member, I don't know if you guys listened, they said that there are no libertarians in McAllister. Uh, I'm here to tell you that that is simply false. Uh, before I begin, though, there are a few people I'd like to recognize and thank. Uh, firstly, um, Calister's administration for allowing us to use this room and making this all possible. Uh, I'd like to also recognize uh, my Calister Young American Liberty co-chair, Mr. Peter Talon, and uh, other members of Yale. Uh, also, from the Gary Johnson campaign, I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Charles Broman, uh, Kara Schultz, uh, and Dan Murphy, and another, another uh, Gary Johnson campaign staff. Uh, <clears throat> Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. I'm Anish Krishnan, the co-chair of Calister Young Americans for Liberty and help organize this event. Uh, I'd like to welcome you uh, all to what we're calling the Rally for Jobs, Opportunity, and Diversity. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here, uh, addressing you all on this fine Friday. In fact, it's such an honor that I actually skipped my organic chemistry class to be here. <laughs> By the way, Professor Hoy, if you're watching this right now, I'm actually very, very sick. <laughs> <laughs> but when I first heard the name for this rally, the Rally for Jobs, Opportunity, and Diversity, I admit I was a little skeptical. But then I remembered that I'm a McAllister student, and after all, jobs, opportunity, diversity, these are all things, these are all ideas that have always been and will always be integral to McAllister as both a school and as a home. I'm addressing you here not as the co-chair of McAllister Young Americans for Liberty, not as a supporter of Governor Gary Johnson, uh, and not even as a voter, but I'm here as a student, a student who understands the values of our freedoms. Uh, in fact, it is impossible to have jobs, opportunity, or diversity without first having liberty, the freedom to choose, the right to privacy, the liberty to do what we want with our own bodies. We can't have a truly happy or prosperous society without first recognizing and often fighting hard to protect them. And ultimately, it's when we stop recognizing our freedoms when they slowly erode. Our country was built on certain ideals, that we have unalienable rights, not suggested negotiable privileges. And I think it's safe to say that if our founding fathers were here and today and saw our nation as it is today, they would be nothing less than shocked at all of our wars, at all of our, the infringements and our civil liberties, and at all of our debt. This is something liberal, liberals and conservatives alike should agree upon. After all, does anyone who has read the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution seriously believe that if Thomas Jefferson or James Madison were here today, they'd say, what an amazing institution the TSA is. Or, I wish we had the ability to wiretap back in my time. And the great proponents of freedom understood that with it comes responsibility. You alone are responsible for your actions. You must have the right to put what you want inside your body. But you will also have the responsibility to make a wise judgment about that. The federal government has no right to be your nanny. The federal government should not protect an individual from himself or herself. And the federal government should not bail out businesses that have made poor financial decisions. I said that I was addressing you as a student, but I'm also addressing you as an American, and as a proud one at that. Uh, the reason I'm here talking to you all about liberty is because we have a candidate running for office uh, for the President of the United States who understands that rights aren't gifts from lawmakers, that rights are part of who we are as individuals. We have a candidate whose tenure as governor of New Mexico reflected that notion with very successful outcomes. And you will hear from this man later, but he isn't the only politician who will fight and defend our freedoms. Candidates for office at state and even local levels understand these principles. One of them is here today. He's running for state representative for Minnesota's District 64A. Some of you know him already, and even if you don't, you definitely see his campaign literature everywhere. Uh, you, might, you might have seen his stickers in, in the walls, the ceilings, to the backs of other students. Uh, he's an exceptional candidate, and I'm proud to call him my friend. Everyone, please welcome Mr. Andrew Ada.
that was a pretty good, pretty great introduction, Anish. Uh, thanks again for putting it on. I didn't actually tell him what to say, even though he's my roommate and good friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> but um, again, if we can give a round of applause to Anish, I know it's not a good thing. Thank you very much. I was practicing my speech you know, a couple seconds ago, and uh, Governor Johnson, like a great libertarian, reminded me of moral hazard and said if I had my speech today, I'd probably stumble a lot more than what I do now. So I, I still have it, it's in my pocket, so if I make mistakes, I won't. <laughs> so I'd like to start off, I guess, but a little bit by introducing myself. I am Andrew Ada, like he said. And I am a candidate right here in 64 in McAllister's district. I'm a McAllister student. I am actually in my second semester of my junior year. And um, I study political science and German, like, you know, double majors like any other McAllister student. Um, I was thinking about what I can address, you know, my, my fellow students here, to what is most pertinent to the needs of everyone else, what would they would like to hear. Um, obviously, liberty is something that everybody would like to hear. We have candidates right here, if you guys want to stand up. There's candidates all over the city of St. Paul, if you guys want to give them a round of applause. <laughs> and uh, right there in the back, taking some photos, is Tony Hernandez. He's a candidate in 60, or for CD4 right here in St. Paul. These are people that have heard the concerns of other individuals and know that our government is getting out of control to a certain extent. And they'll continue to go out of control to every extent. But going back to a little bit about who I am and my talk, I thought the idea of opportunity would be, probably be the best to talk to you about. You know, as a young individual, or as young individuals, you have the opportunity to learn and progress here at McAllister and other institutions. I know we have some St. Cloud State individuals and students from other colleges as well. And I decided, you know, I could talk about what it's like to be at 3 a.m. working on the paper the night before it's due for a 9 a.m. class. Woo! <laughs> or I could talk, you know, kind of about the opportunities we have as Americans right now and the opportunities that our parents had. A little bit about me. My story is somewhat unique. Everyone has a unique story to them. And every individual, in essence, could give an entire, entirely great talk about this idea of you know, where they come from. But since I'm, I'm behind the microphone, I guess I'll give mine. My parents and grandparents came from the northern states of Mexico. Not New Mexico, actually, my, my dad lived there for a while, so. But um, my grandparents grew up in very humble circumstances um, for the most part. A lot of their, you know, raising my parents were in situations where they lived on railroad tracks, they lived in rough neighborhoods, they lived with not enough to necessarily provide for what we would consider in our basic needs. They wanted more for themselves, they wanted more for their children, they wanted more for you know, my parents' children, me and, and my future children. So they you know, made the decision to come to the United States knowing that there were opportunities here that were, not, or that were not available to them otherwise. My dad and his family actually grew up migrant farmers up and down the West Coast. My mom and her family were you know, blue collar workers working in aeros aerospace technology, basically, or putting together planes in factories where primarily they spoke Spanish. Um, it was a difficult time for my parents having to learn English, and it wasn't easy. But this opportunity they had, that they could share it to their children, was what drew them closer and closer to their ultimate goal. When my parents finally married, and settled down right after high school, they struggled. It was a really hard time, you know, just out of high school, really nothing they had. And my father just went to work. Just straight, no questions asked, went to work. Many times growing up, 
I remember my dad actually working three jobs to provide for the necessities of my family. And I know how proud they were when I had the opportunity to accept the admission right here to McAllister College, a really great institution. You know, something that they knew would benefit me in the future. My time at McAllister, I came here a few years ago. I did not quite know where the decision to come to McAllister would actually lead me. After my first year, I decided to forego some of my education for temp you know, temporarily, and I actually did some missionary work out in the German countries, and I learned dialects of you know, a couple of German languages to spread my faith and also spread um, some of the experiences I had you know, in my situation. So I'm fortunate enough to be able to say Hufi <laughs> which is one of the hardest Swiss German words to say. If you ever go to Switzerland, they will ask you to say it, so we'll get you practice now. <laughs> Growing up where I grew up, you know, very, you know, my, my parents grew up in humble circumstances. My parents did more for us. The opportunity to go and live in, in Europe for a couple of years was something that I never would have thought of a few years ago. That I would have had the opportunity, one, to study at a great college, and two, to be able to go out and to live in Europe, spreading something I truly believed in. When I came back here, that's when I became extensively more active in politics. Like any hardworking, full-time student who has a job on the side, I decided to add more to my plate by getting into politics and receiving the endorsement to run in this area. It's been hard, but I know that each one of us here stands on the shoulders of the individuals who came before them. These opportunities were laid previous by our parents, by our parents' parents. I'm really excited for this opportunity to share my story to be able to explain to others that in the United States of America, we are free to grab our future and direct where we want to go. I'm really excited you know, for Governor Johnson's campaign. It's really great. It shows that ideas are much more powerful than a party or than X, Y, or Z. It shows that one individual can make a difference Everybody has a unique opportunity to them, like I said. And everyone can make it a great impact. I know people, like Anish, who would stay up till 4 a.m., working on OCHEM paper, skipping OCHEM class, to have the opportunity to share to you the ideas of liberty, the ideas of free market principles, and the idea of social tolerance. And I'm really thankful that we have this opportunity to hear from these speakers today. Um, I don't want to take too much more time because, you know, Jesse Ventura is a Navy SEAL and, you know, I'll stay away from that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so, in closing, I would just like to say, we are a blessed country. We have the opportunities to continue where we, to better our circumstances. I'm really fortunate that there are leaders like Governor Johnson who think there are more important things than the luxuries of staying at home and living in the normal one now. Getting out of your comfort zone and actively creating a difference. So again, I'm Andrew Rahita. I'm a student here at McAllister. I'm an American. And I'm really excited for this opportunity to, to hear the other candidates. And may liberty continue to reign, and may God bless you guys. Thank you, Andrew. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce former governor of Minnesota uh, and fellow lover of liberty, uh, Jesse Matura.
Good afternoon. I, you know, you love to talk to groups like this, but unfortunately, it's preaching to the choir. That's why we're all here. You know, uh, the people that should be hearing this aren't. You are. But what is the result of here is for you to go out and call it recruit, call it whatever you need to be, but to get the message out that they're, you know, that our country's in trouble right now. I firmly believe that. I used to I used to live my life and think no matter what happened that tomorrow would be a better day, that that opportunity would be there. I can't say that today. Today I have to say tomorrow could be a worse day. And that's the first time, I'm 61 now, and that's the first time I've ever uttered those words, that tomorrow could be a worse day for the United States of America. Um, I met Governor Johnson I guess it's 12, 13 years ago, a whole decade ago, probably half of you in the room never couldn't even vote back then. I'm guessing that if you're college students. And, uh, I was the independent governor of Minnesota. There was one other independent governor by the, who I might add, from all indications, is going to be a senator now, Governor Angus King of Maine, a phenomenal man. Uh, he's running in Maine. He went back into the private sector for 10 years. And now he's come out and he's, in a, by what I'm hearing in the polls, he's going to win by a landslide. So rest assured there will be an independent voice somewhere in the Senate. And if it's close enough in that Senate, he could be a major power broker. Because uh, if, if it, it's one vote that tips either way, whatever way they go, and, and Angus will be an independent, he's a wonderful man. But I met Governor Johnson 12 years ago as at what he was then. He was what you would call a moderate Republican. Well, Governor Johnson's no longer a Republican because the Republicans are no longer moderate. Right. Maybe, maybe that's the way you so, so, so of course, for, for people like Gary and myself, it just took Gary longer to figure out he doesn't belong in these two parties. I learned it 20 years ago or more that I didn't belong with them. I'm fiscally conservative, but I'm socially liberal. That means you don't fit. You don't fit. That means if you're spelling government, and, and it also means a social liberal is, I don't care what people do as long as they don't harm their neighbor. It's up to them. Um, I urge people to vote no on the ballot on both. They want to amend our Constitution to discriminate. And that's purely what it is. It is the most flagrant discrimination you will ever see. And they want the Constitution of Minnesota to okay that. Remember, constitutions are there to protect your rights. They're not there to discriminate and manage your rights. They're protection devices. And, and so again, I urge people, you know, I've been married 37 years now. It doesn't affect my marriage to my wife at all if two gay people want to make the same commitment. Um, it's absurd. It, it, it shouldn't even be on the ballot. And I'll tell you why. It's a civil rights issue. You never, you should have elected officials who have courage. The courage to do the right thing. And it should not be on a ballot for the public to make that decision because you're asking a majority to make a decision that affects a minority. If they allow that, we probably still have slavery. You know, if they allow for people to vote on, on a, a majority to vote on a minority issue. But unfortunately, we have to do that because uh, the elected officials don't have the courage to do it themselves, so they figure they'll put it up to the people. And uh, I will tell you something. If, these, if, if the measure against gay marriage here, if it passes and goes on the Constitution, I will have a difficult time living in Minnesota anymore. Because I don't want to live in a state that discriminates to that level. I do not want to do it. I'm having a tough time living here anyway because I hate winter. <laughs> yeah, and I live in your home country now, actually a territory of your home country all winter for four months. Here. I live down now in Baja, California, sir. And uh, it's interesting down there because the Mexican people that cross from the Baja to mainland Mexico have to clear customs. Did you know that? 
they have to do that. They have to clear customs. So it's kind of a territory unto itself, but I love it down there. It's remarkable. But getting back to the message on hand, uh, in light of our Supreme Court's recent decision that I think is going to destroy this country, that corporations have the same rights as individuals and that money is free speech, we need to start working by electing people like Governor Johnson and people of his ilk who will move to there we need to amend the Constitution. Because the only way that you can overturn a Supreme Court decision is to amend the Constitution. We need to amend it to state corporations do not have the rights of individuals and money is not free speech. I mean, think of this scenario today. A foreign country can decide your next leader here. All they have to do is form a corporation, plus there's no open disclosure. You know, if they're gonna put these boatloads of money and buy our elections, they should at least have open disclosure so that we as voters know who's doing the buying. They don't even have to do that now. They don't have to disclose anything. Uh, I found out that I actually stole this from Gary, unknowingly, I probably heard him say it somewhere, and couldn't remember who, but uh, he's given me permission to continue on with the message. I think all presidential candidates should be required to wear NASCAR racing suits. <laughs> For those of you that ever watch NASCAR, like say the 48 Chev, Jimmy Johnson wins, and he, at the end, you notice they got all those patches all over the suit of their sponsors. Well, let's get those for their biggest donors, their biggest drivers. So that we guys, as citizens, we have to have the ability to make an informed decision. Who owns this Rebloodlican or this Democrat? You notice what I call them. Who owns them? And who are they going to pay allegiance to? Who's bought them off? And uh, so it's not a bad idea. You know, even though you, it gets a chuckle and all that. But getting back, this, this decision by the Supreme Court is going to be the downfall of our country. Because well, now a corporation, a foreign country, could form a corporation, they could pump this money in here without any open disclosure and could literally, literally control who your leaders are going to be. Used to be against the law. Corporations couldn't give to political campaigns. Used to be against the law. So, you got a lot of work to do. And again, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, that's why you're here. But we've got to go out, we've got to educate people, and we've got to get a new mindset. When you run as a third candidate, mainstream media, they're the culprits too. Because what do they tell when I ran? Well, if you vote for Jesse, Jesse can't win. It's a wasted vote. How many people have heard that? Yeah. Wasted vote. I'd like to change that mindset and reverse it and state that if you vote for a Democrat or Republican, you've wasted your vote. Because you're going to get the same thing. It does not matter. There will be no change. I just wrote a recent book that, where I saw Gary last week that's uh, out there called The Democrats and the Republicans, subtitled No More Gangs in Government. And I've made the comparison between, and I do apologize to the Crips and Bloods <laughs> for putting them into that company, but I felt it was needed and I hope they'll understand. But uh, they've even gone so far, they've, they've, they've stolen the gang's colors. Because when you're in a gang, you have what are called colors. I know, I was in one in my youth. I was an outlaw biker. And bikers have colors and wear patches and wear all that. Well, the Crips' colors are blue. What's a blue state? It's a democratic state. The Bloods' colors are naturally red. What's a red state or a Republican state? So they've even stolen their color codes of the, of the street gangs. But let me state this to you unequivocally. The Democrats and the, and the Republicans are even more dangerous than the street gang. And I'll tell you why. The street gangs only affect you if you live in their neighborhoods. Most of us don't. Now, they could affect you. But here's the difference. The Republicans and Democrats affect every person in this whole country, across the board. Things that they do affect each and every one of us. And it, it is time to end, as I like to quote my friend Ralph Nader, the two-party dictatorship. 
because that's what it is. When I taught at Harvard in 2004, I did a class called How Pro Wrestling Prepares You for Politics. <laughs> and it truly does, because in pro wrestling, Murphy's Law will always be there in a match. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong, so you've got to be able to think on your feet. Same as in politics. In pro wrestling, the way you sell yourself and make money is to, at the microphone, in my day, you, I used to have to piss everybody off so bad they would pay their hard-earned dollars to see me get my butt kicked. That was my job. Well, what's the difference between that and uh, getting someone's money or getting someone's vote? It still requires you to persuade them to do something in your favor. And finally, first and foremost, and probably most important, as I taught at Harvard, is the fact that in pro wrestling, when you see the guy in the ring, he may be nothing like the character he portrays. He could be completely different outside the ring. I mean, I portrayed myself as being, you know, the you know, women falling at my feet, this and that and what have you, and here I've been married now 37 years, you know, to one woman. And uh, uh, so what they portray themselves may be nothing like what they're like. And I think that goes on immensely with these Democrats and Republicans. What you see is not what you get with them. It is not what you get with them. So we need to work hard to get Gary Johnson as many votes as he possibly can. Because the more votes Gary gets, the more scare it's going to put into the system. The more frightened the system is going to become. And then, of course, you're going to see them do drastic things. I don't know how many of you are familiar what happened back in the Perot days. But in, I'll tell you quickly, Ross Perot in 1992 got one out of five votes, and he also qualified for $30 million with the program they had for the next election. Well, at that point, the federal debates were under the League of Women Voters, essentially a fairly neutral group. That's why Perot was allowed to debate. Well, Perot scared them so bad in 92, along came 96, and it was Bob Dole and Bill Clinton now. And what happened? Because Perot scared them so bad in 92, the Democrats and Republicans took the federal presidential debates away from the National League of Women Voters, and they formed a, the Federal Debate Commission, which ironically is, is headed by two former gang leaders. Two of their gang leaders had it. So now they determine, the two gangs or parties determine who you're going to hear now in 96. So here Perot got one out of five votes, qualified for 30 million of our tax dollars in the program they had, and you weren't even going to be allowed to hear him because here's what went down in the back room. Dole did not want Perot in the debates because he felt it would erode from his conservative base. Clinton did not want debates at all because he was so far ahead, debates could only bring him down. They cut the deal. And of course, it got rubber stamped by the Federal Debate Commission. You did, weren't allowed to hear Ross Perot in 96. And normally, there's three presidential debates and one VP debate. 96, that was changed. Remember, Clinton didn't want debate, debates. There was only two presidential debates one VP debate, and because they controlled it so much, those two presidential debates were held on the same night as the World Series. <laughs> now, as good citizens of the country, we should watch the debate, shouldn't we? But we all know, as citizens of the country, given the two, what do you think the majority of people are going to watch? They're going to watch the World Series. Done by design, people. Done by design. You know, it's interesting. They tell us in the private sector that competition is good. That's the essence of capitalism, right, is competition drives prices down. The more competitors there are, the better deal it is for us, the people. Yet the hypocrites within our own government, competition is bad. They give you two. It's very it's very much like walking into the soft drink department at the store. And your only choices are Coke and Pepsi, both colas, one slightly sweeter than the other, depending on your taste buds. That's what we have today. That's their idea of competition. The two gangs choose your president, and then you're made to pick from the two choices they send forward. 
Well, in the words of the late, great Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead, Jerry said, when made to pick the lesser of two evils, it means you're still picking evil. Think about that. <laughs> if you're picking the lesser of two evils, you're still picking evil. So, and by the way, you notice I've uh, got James Marshall Hendrix on my chest today. For those of you that don't know him as that, he's Jimi Hendrix, the greatest guitar player to ever walk the planet, and ever will. Um, Jimi Hendrix said something that I think we all need to remember. He said this, when the love of, when, when the power of love overtakes the love of power, then we will have peace. I don't think I can say it any better. He was dead. When the power of love overtakes the love of power, we will then have peace. And ladies and gentlemen, we need peace. I figured it out the other day. I've been on this planet 61 years now, and if you count the war on drugs, which is certainly a war, 20,000 of our Mexican neighbors died last year and the year before because of this idiotic war that the United States can control simply by legalizing. It'll end the murder. We're more afraid of marijuana than we are murder. So if, if you count the war on drugs and the Cold War, even though for the majority of the Cold War shots weren't fired, how much money was wasted on all the armaments of the two sides of the Cold War for 20 years in these standoffs, if you count them as wars, which I do, we've been at war my entire life virtually. Korea, Vietnam, Grenada, uh, the list on uh, Middle East now, it goes on and on and on. And apparently they want us to believe that the United States can't survive unless we're at perennial war. I'd like to try for once to see if that's true. I'd like for once to see, can we go 15 years of peace? We could have if they hadn't have murdered Jack Kennedy. And you notice I said the word they. They murdered Jack Kennedy. Lee Harvey Oswald didn't do it. Trust me on that one. You're too young to trust me. I've been studying it for 20 years of my life now. So the start is now, and it's the, at a grassroots level for you to go out, for you to convince people to vote for Gary Johnson. I'm doing it every opportunity I get, and I use my way. You're wasting your vote if you vote for a Democrat or Republican, because you're going to get the same government. You know, Obama ran on change, and I made the statement a week ago, the only change I can tell between him and Bush basically is the color of his skin. The administration of the same. We're still holding people without trials. Habeas corpus hasn't been given back to us. We're expanding the TSA. They're busting the medical marijuana industry left and right. I'm sorry, I don't see no change. Nothing. The only way to get change in this country is for us to do it. And the way we do that is to stop electing Democrats and Republicans. It can start at the local level. It can go to the state level. And hopefully, suffer all the way to the federal level. Governor Johnson's blazing a path. And if we keep the momentum running, he will blaze the path for people that come after him. And that might be me. <laughs> I never ever used a prepared speech when I ran for governor of our great state, and as you can see, I still don't. I talk from the heart, and I talk and shoot from the hip. Am I going to say a few things that will be controversial? You're damn right. Who cares? We used to have a First Amendment that allowed you to say controversial. Always remember, the First Amendment's there not to protect popular speech. It's there to protect unpopular speech. That's why we have it. What happens in this election will have a great bearing of what happens in 2016, 2020, and as life progresses in our country. So again, I urge you, get out there. It's going to require a grassroots level. You're going to get no help from the media. 
The media was supposed to be our fourth branch of government, the unwritten branch was supposed to watch dog the other three. Well, I heard something interesting. I heard Dan Rather talk a couple weeks ago. And Dan Rather made the statement that everything he said about George Bush's war record, military, well, I shouldn't say war record, everything he said about his military record was completely true. Completely true, and he got fired for it. Can you imagine you tell the truth and you get fired? Is that the America today? But the more important thing that Rather talked about, he talked about how 20 years ago, there were 40 independent media outlets in this country that you could get information from. Today, I believe we're down to four with these corporate takeovers. So four corporations decide, basically, what you all are going to hear and all that. But then we're lucky we have an outlet called the internet. Thank goodness for the internet. Get ready. They're not going to let the internet run free. They will attempt and probably are doing whatever they can to take it over. I did one show on conspiracy theory about are we turning into a police state where we discovered a bill sponsored by Homeland Security that would call, tell FEMA to build six major internment camps throughout America. I went out there to Congress to inquire for whom? Dissidents like me, former governors and mayors who speak out? against a busted political system that's based completely on bribery. Again, if we bribe, we go to jail. Their whole system's based upon it. Bribery. And that show aired one time and then disappeared. True TV won't even acknowledge we did it now. They've taken it off the internet, so somehow they have the power to do that also. I even had Man Cow, the disc jockey from Chicago, said he had recorded it, and they wiped it out of his recorded internet. Now, I'm not an expert, because I'm happy to tell you I'm computer illiterate. I'm happy to tell you that I've never owned a cell phone, nor will I ever. Call me a dinosaur, but they ain't tracking Jesse Ventura. <laughs> when you got all those other things, they can track you. And maybe that's my old military coming out at me again, you know. But again, we're at a critical state, ladies and gentlemen, of of what the United States is going to be into the future now and where we've evolved from in the past. And let me finish by saying I encourage everyone. I don't write my books now necessarily for money. I take no upfront money. Sure, if they sell good, I get checks down the line. But I challenge anyone to read my latest book, Democrips and the Bloodlickens, No More Gangs in Government. And if you vote for a Democrat or Republican after reading that book, then you are the problem. You are not the solution. How anyone? Did you know 21 of them are convicted felons and we have still pay their retirement? Convicted felons. They're all telling you, oh, Obamacare, government-run health care, no good. What hypocrisy. They have five choices of government-run health care. Five of them. Most of us have maybe one, many none. So my belief is that they shouldn't get anything that we get, that we shouldn't get. Why should an elected official get something that we as citizens can't have? Whether you agree with government-run health care or not, if they got it, we should have the option of it. Or take it away from them. <laughs> one way or the other. Either one way or the other. Don't let them have anything that you can't have or vice versa. So I'll finish off today again by stating I'm worried about this country. I'm worried about the direction it's going and I'm worried for you, the younger people I see here. By the time a lot of this comes about, I may not be here no more. You know, who knows? It may take a while, but it's moving awful quick. And the choice is yours now. And again, I'm preaching to the choir today. It's up to you to go out and find a choir that doesn't agree and preach to them. That's what's got to have happen. You know, that is what has to happen. And I will proudly, this fall, cast my vote for Governor Gary Johnson for president. I never voted for a Democratic and I'm not about to start now. And then as far as, I'll leave you with a little train of thought. I do things differently. 
Most of you probably don't even realize that when I ran for governor here, I only raised $300,000. I actually made more money doing the job than I spent to get it. I don't think there's a, an elected official of a major party in the last 50 years that can make that statement. That they, made, and you know why I did that? My dad. My dad was a World War II vet, six bronze battle stars in Europe, and I can also say my mother was a World War II veteran. Not many people can say their mom was. She was a nurse in North Africa. And one day when I was 16 years old, my dad only had an eighth grade education, came here to the Bohemian Flats down by Seven Corners down there where us Slovaks come from. And my dad said to me one day when I came home from school and I was about 16 or 17 in high school, he said, you know, all politicians are crooks. And I looked at my dad and said, come on, Dad, you can't make a blanket statement like that. They can't all be crooks. He said, yes, they can. You want to know why? I said, why? He said, because they pay a million dollars for a job that only pays a hundred grand. Now, in his basic eighth grade education and world, you get what I'm saying. In the private sector, they would lock you up at Bellevue Mental Hospital in New York if you said you were going to go out and spend a, hundred, a million dollars for a job that paid you less than you're going to make. Yet yeah, that's our political system that we have today. I, I, I didn't have to say that with my dad, but the only thing I regret was my mom and dad were gone when I became governor. And I would have loved for them to be here so I could look at my dad and say, Dad, your son is not a crook. I made more money doing the job than I spent to get it. Why? Because I think we ran a great campaign about ideas instead of money. And so when I say Gary's paving the road, if Jesse decides in 2016, unless Gary wins, then I won't do anything. I'll happily go about my business and enjoy my country going in the right direction. But we all know it's going to be tough for Gary because what we have to demand is he be allowed in the debates. You can't win the rest of the debate. They know this. They're not dumb. They know you can't win unless you're allowed to debate. Why do you think they keep him out? Because they don't want to give him any chance to win. Because I proved in Minnesota I was pulling 10% at the primary. And seven weeks later, I was your governor. Why? I was allowed to debate. I was allowed to debate. So we've got to open these debates up for more ideas, more people, more competition. Because in capitalism, competition is good. Well, if we're a capitalist country, then competition should be good in politics too. More than that. But as I said, there's nothing in my madness always, and I have to stay loyal to my father. I don't know if it's possible to run for president and make more money doing the job than you did than you spent to get it. But I still despise fundraising. It's legalized panhandling and bribery is all that it is. And our entire system is based on it. So I'm working at a way that if I do do it in 2016, I will do it for the least amount of money possible with the biggest impact possible that could take place. And, I, and I'll just say that uh, I'll leave you with this. You can figure out the rest. Howard Stern. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let me just say that. Serious radio doesn't fall on FCC regulations. They can't take Howard off the air. And I'll leave you thinking about that because the FCC, so get ready. I'm sure they're going to try to take over Serious radio. They'll figure out some mechanism to try to take it over and this, that, and whatever. So I'll leave you just with those thoughts. But again, I wholeheartedly, I'm going to take off now. Join me in voting for Gary Johnson, the former New Mexico governor, the former member of the Bloods who saw the light and is now running independently, or independent as you can be, because the Libertarians stand for independency. So, uh, Join me in, in voting for Gary. Cast your vote loud and proud. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Tell them when you vote, if you vote, that you vote proudly for a third person, a third entity 
because if we don't get that third entity, I don't know where our country's headed. So again, thank you very, very much. It was my pleasure to be here today and keep up the good work.
It hurts me that her pursuit of happiness and our land may not be achieved because of a constitutional amendment that wants to close the discussion. It is painful, painful for me to watch as people want to define what marriage is and what family should look like because we all know it, that all families, I guarantee you, come in all different sizes and shapes. So I stand before you all and ask that when you leave here today to continue your support and share your personal story with people in your life why passing this amendment will hurt not just you, but everyone in the state of Minnesota. With only 47, 45 days left and only 1% down in the polls, please, I urge you, open your hearts and start a courageous conversation with people who are conflicted. Walk with them. I urge you to show your support for our community and for yourself by volunteering with us in the next 45 days. Today I bring with me a group of wonderful volunteers um, from the House of Rising, as we call ourselves, <laughs> um, who are passing around clipboards. So please sign up and join us in defeating this amendment. Um, and then please also indicate which day is best for you to volunteer. And I promise you, it will be worth your time. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for upholding love and happiness in our state, for standing up to say that Minnesota is an inclusive place for all people, and for safeguarding your fellow neighbors. It is you who truly lets freedom ring and that prove that love conquers all. So together, let's be the state and vote now in November! Thank you. I think that a, uh, a homeless person in this country uh, could identify what the problems are that we are facing. Uh, I think a homeless person in this country could actually point out what the solutions are to the problems that we have in this country, but a homeless person can't run for president of the United States. You have to have a resume to do that. I think I have a resume to do this. And my resume would suggest that not only can I do this job, but I can do a really good job at it. I have been an entrepreneur my entire life. I started a one-man handyman business. I grew it into over a thousand employees. I sold the business in 1999. Nobody lost their job. They're doing better than ever. It allows me to have a full-time unpaid job doing this. I had never been involved in politics prior to running for governor of New Mexico. I went and I introduced myself to the Republican Party two weeks before I announced. John Latuzio, chairman of the Republican Party, he says, wow, I like what you've got to say. I like what you've done. We're an inclusive party, we're going to include you in the whole thing, you know, debates, discussions, you come along, you make your case, but you just need to know that you will never win that it's not possible to come from completely outside of politics and get elected governor, a Republican governor, in a state that's two to one Democrat. I got elected. I'd like to think it was based on what I had to say, which was just to bring a common sense business approach to state government. Best product, best service, lowest price. Let me make decisions in my life that I should be making, not the government. Less government is better government. I got elected. I may have vetoed more bills as governor of New Mexico than the other 49 governors in the country combined. I vetoed 750 bills. I had thousands of line item vetoes as governor of New Mexico. I took line item veto to a new art form. It made a difference when it came to billions of dollars worth of spending. It made a difference when it came to legislation that in my opinion, was just going to add time and money to all of our lives, wasn't going to make us any healthier, wasn't going to make us any more safe, it was just going to make, like I say, add more burden to the lives that we were living. So I said no. Well, how did that all turn out? 
in a state that was two to one Democrat, being a penny pincher, talking about less government, talking about keeping government out of the bedroom, I get elected governor, re-elected as governor by a bigger margin the second time than the first time I should have been ridden out on a rail. I think it just speaks volumes to the fact that people really appreciate good stewardship of tax dollars. Three, three things in the, in the course of this presidential cycle. One, they did a poll of all the presidential candidates and their favorabilities in their own states. There's only one presidential candidate in this cycle, and I'm talking about all the presidential candidates who's viewed favorably in his or her own state. It's me. How does that work out in New Mexico? In New Mexico, people wave at me with all five fingers, not just one. <laughs> Then they did a study on job creation. Which person running for governor had the best record when it came to job creation? It was me. My response to that was the same as it was when I was governor of New Mexico. I didn't create one single job as governor of New Mexico. The private sector creates jobs, but I created, I created an environment of certainty. I appointed all the boards and commissions. I appointed the heads of all the agencies. I controlled all rules and regulations. And I would suggest to you that rules and regulations got better on a daily basis with just a fundamental basis in common sense. Less time, less money. Make it easy to comply with government. And then lastly, and I think this is really important, the ACLU last December came out with a report card on all the presidential candidates and how they do on civil liberties. Now the ACLU, a group dedicated to civil liberties, a group dedicated to the Constitution, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, a group dedicated to civil liberties, came out with a report card, 24 liberty torches was a perfect score. This is important. Mitt Romney, Rick Santorum, zero liberty torches out of 24. Newt Gingrich, four Liberty Torches out of 24. President Obama, 16 Liberty Torches out of 24. Ron Paul, 18 Liberty Torches out of 24. Gary Johnson, 21 Liberty Torches out of 24. I'm gonna be on the ballot in all 50 states. Right now, Right now, I'm on the ballot in 47 states in the District of Columbia. We are litigated in the three states where I'm not on the ballot. And believe me, I should be on the ballot. We should prevail. But although there are other third party candidates, no other third party is going to come close to 50 state ballot access. I believe, and I might be wrong, but I believe the Green Party is going to be on, in, on 30 states. I believe the Constitution Party is going to be on eight states. Um, nobody comes close to 50 state ballot access. So when I talk about my opponents, I'm going to talk about Mitt Romney, and I'm going to talk about Barack Obama. There are big differences. And those big differences start with the fact that I am the only candidate that does not want to bomb Iran. two-year bombing maintenance program of Iran. We're going to make another hundred million enemies to this country that we would not otherwise have. The biggest demonstration in the world after 9-11 in support of the United States was in Iran, where over a million demonstrators showed up in support of the United States. And we're going to bomb the citizens of Iran we're going to make another 100 million enemies to this country that wouldn't otherwise exist. I'm the only candidate who wants to get out of Afghanistan now and bring the troops home. Politicians that beat their chests and are going to save us from all the ills of the world, they're going to save us from the terrorist threat, 
and it comes at a cost of hundreds of thousands of innocents dying in the countries that we are militarily intervening in. It comes at a cost of our men and service women dying, coming back in body bags, coming back with their limbs blown off. Let's stop with the military interventions that have us with hundreds of millions of enemies to this country that we wouldn't have but for those military interventions. I believe in marriage equality. I think that it is a constitutionally guaranteed right on par with civil rights of the 60s and fundamental to serving as President of the United States would be strict adherence to the United States Constitution. I think this is a federal issue where all of us are entitled to inalienable rights, this being one of those rights. I am the only candidate that wants to end the drug war. Let's legalize marijuana now. And we are at a tipping point on this issue. Colorado has it on the ballot in November to regulate marijuana like alcohol. I think it's going to pass. Let's not forget that six years ago, Denver citizens voted to decriminalize marijuana on a campaign based on marijuana being safer than alcohol. I think it's the first of 50 dominoes that will fall. I think when Colorado legalizes marijuana, and all of a sudden the planes are filled up with, uh, uh, with Minnesotans uh, headed to Denver for the weekend to chill out. I think everybody's going to catch on to this really quick and it will be a rapid progression to rational drug policy in this country. I am the only candidate that wants to repeal the Patriot Act. <laughs> If veto work, if I would have been President of the United States, I would have never signed the Patriot Act in the first place. There would be no homeland security. There would be no TSA. I would leave airport security to the airlines, to the airports, states, municipalities. There are big, big differences between myself and my opponents. I am the only candidate that would not have signed the National Defense Authorization Act along for arrest of the children of you and I as U.S. citizens without being charged. I am the only candidate that believes that we need to balance the federal budget now. If we don't balance the federal budget now, we are going to find ourselves in a monetary collapse. What's a monetary collapse? It's when the dollars that we have don't buy a thing because of the accompanying inflation that goes along with borrowing and printing money to the tune of 43 cents out of every dollar. So I'm the only candidate that's talking about Right now, Democrats and Republicans are arguing over who's going to spend more money on Medicare. We all recognize that there has to be a process here of mutual sacrifice or we find ourselves with nothing. So they're all arguing about who's going to spend more money on Medicare when we need to have an honest discussion in this country over how we have to slash Medicare spending, or we find ourselves with no health care for those over 65 at all. And that goes for Medicaid also. That goes for military spending. Crony capitalism is alive and well in this country. Both parties have their hands out, they're selling loopholes, individuals, groups, corporations are paying for those loopholes. I am the only candidate advocating eliminating income tax, corporate tax, abolishing the IRS, and replacing all of that with one federal consumption tax. In this case, I am embracing the fair tax. I think it reboots the American economy for the next 100 years. 
in a zero corporate tax rate environment, if the private sector doesn't create tens of millions of jobs in this country, I don't know what it takes to create tens of millions of jobs in this country. It ends up bleeding out all existing federal tax out of goods and services. So it's really the answer when it comes to our exports. It's the answer to China, making our exports 23% more uh, competitive. It's rebooting the American economy. It's at its heart better. And we can get into a debate and a discussion over the fair tax and what's the best way to implement a national consumption tax, one federal tax, but we can have that debate and that discussion, but it's not happening right now. It's not on the radar screen. I'm the only candidate that would abolish the Federal Reserve if I had legislation in front of me to abolish the Federal Reserve. It's an inside game. Treasury is printing money. The Federal Reserve is loaning that money to the banks at 0%. The banks aren't loaning it out to you or I because they're buying up treasuries in a closed loop. They have to take no risk whatsoever to garner profits that you and I are paying for. How do you get into this? How do you do this? It's what's happening. At a minimum, let's audit the Federal Reserve. Let's shine light on this. We shine light on a room full of cockroaches in a dark room. Everybody scatters. We'll all benefit from seeing that. And then as President of the United States, you know what? That's not legislation to audit the Federal Reserve. That is, a, that is a, an executive order to audit the Federal Reserve. The fact that you get to appoint the head of the Federal Reserve, that, 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 would, be a, uh, that would be one of the criteria for getting hired uh, in that position to begin with. So a few words about my opponents. Mitt Romney. Man, I got to think the guy is smart. I have to. Here's what he says regarding building a fence across the border. He says it's a no-brainer to build a fence across the border. You are listening to somebody without one molecule of brain. <laughs> Mitt Romney says that we need to balance the federal budget, but that we need to spend more money on the military and we need to hold Medicare in check. It doesn't add up. We all finished the second grade and there was a mathematics that came along with the second grade. It doesn't add up. And then Barack Obama, I have to tell you, I view that what comes out of his mouth as music. He plays a violin, and the words that come out are wonderful. It's just that there's no connection between the words and the reality. He said some really favorable things about gay rights, but he's taken a position on marriage equality that it should be left to the states. Well, 41 states have said marriage is only between a man and a woman. Vote no here in Minnesota. Don't become the 42nd state. But this should be a federal issue. This is a constitutionally guaranteed right. I thought he said incredibly favorable things when it came to our state of perpetual war, our military interventions, and yet we find ourselves in a continued state of war. Let me go out on a limb here. Mitt Romney or Barack Obama are re-elected. We are going to have a heightened police state in this country. Regardless of the two, we're going to find ourselves in a continued state of military intervention. We're going to find ourselves with a continued unsustainable debt and spending trajectory that is going to end up in a monetary collapse, if not fixed. And then Barack Obama said some really favorable things regarding the drug war. He said, I will not spend federal resources on cracking down on medical marijuana facilities in states where states, legislatures, or citizens have voted these programs into place. And he has flown in the face of that completely by raiding facilities in California and Colorado. This is not acceptable. There is nothing in my resume to suggest that everything that I am talking about here that I am not going to doggedly pursue. 
that I am not going to get up every single morning and take this debate and this discussion in all these categories to the American public because I think we all recognize that we have to embark on a process of mutual sacrifice or we're going to find ourselves with nothing. Today, this morning, MSNBC is reporting about every eight minutes they were reporting Gary Johnson is at 6% of the national vote. Let me ask you a question. For every hundred times that you hear Obama's name, do you hear my name six times? For every hundred times that you hear Romney's name, do you hear my name six times? Look, for every 5,000 times that you hear Barack Obama's name, do you hear my name one time? Maybe. Point here is, this is kind of good news, bad news. When people hear my name, when people see, when, when people see that it's being recorded at 6%, it draws a lot of attention to the campaign. And that is what's happening now. So I don't want you to think that I'm standing up here thinking this is some sort of protest vote. If there is anything that is, has, is to have been learned over the last year, anything is possible. We had six Republicans go to the top of the heap for a 17-day cycle. Look, one of my big concerns is peaking too early in this whole thing. And based on that 17 days, this, the wave just needs to happen in the middle of October. There's plenty of time, all right? But it does come to all of you. It comes to all of you, and it comes to asking your friends and neighbors and friends and family to just check this guy out. Just check him out. I don't know how many of you have been to the website isidewith.com. I think, I, think I think it's terrific. I mean, you get online, answer 36 questions. They end up pairing you up with the presidential candidate most in line with your views. President Obama right now gets uh, 330 electoral votes. I get 230. Mitt Romney gets zero, according to the 3.4 million people who have taken this survey. And that's where I get back to Obama. If you just match yourself up on the words, <laughs> I match up with what Obama has to say. The words are magic, but the reality doesn't match the words. So I want to thank all of you for allowing me to be here. I want to thank all of you for your activism, and I want to close here with a question. And the question is, what if you all waste your vote and vote for me? I'm the next president of the United States. for a couple of days, but uh, maybe open this up to any questions, comments, and insults here for a few minutes. Yes? Johnson, um, uh, in my opinion, one of the biggest threats to the American democracy and economy today is corporate power that's left unchecked. Huge corporations like Walmart and Nike and Apple outsource manufacturing jobs in China and Malaysia, and they set up chain operations in the U.S. which take away the business of small business. So, um, from what I understand, you support abolishing the corporate income tax and deregulating the economy. You know, that's a that's a libertarian small government thing. thing. And you want to abolish? Sorry, sorry. You want to abolish the income tax, which would leave the one percent with a lot more money than they already have. So, if you're president, how will you limit corporate power and how will you protect the average American from being exploited? Well, so, so I'm going to take the tact here, the, the belief that what we need to be promoting are free markets. And I think as, as, a, as a country, as citizens, I don't think we just, I, I think that the problem is crony capitalism. I think it's the fact that corporations do buy special uh, favors, uh, that there is a favoritism in the system, and that by adopting the fair tax, you actually bleed all of that out. 
that I don't think um, Republicans understand the difference between free market and crony capitalism, and so often the criticism of free markets actually is a criticism of crony capitalism, and that's what we've grown in this country. Uh, how are you going to get Congress to work with you to achieve your goal, Obama? Okay, so how do, how do I get, how does a libertarian president get Congress to go along with this? Look, I think a libertarian president could challenge Democrats to be good at what they're supposed to be good at, civil liberties. So how about getting out of Afghanistan? How about not bombing Iran? How about bringing about marriage equality? How about ending the drug wars? These things that Democrats should be good about, but they're not good at it at all. And then... And then how about challenging Republicans on what they're supposed to be good at, which is dollars and cents, and they're not good at that at all. Uh, we're going to balance the budget in 28 years, and it's incumbent upon growth. You know, this is burying your head in your, in, in, under the sand. So challenging Republicans, challenging Democrats, the notion that I am more liberal than Obama on many issues. I am much more conservative than Romney on many, many issues. To me, speaking with a broad brush stroke, the uh, majority of Americans are fiscally responsible and socially accepting. I'm in that category. I think the most of Americans are in that category, and we are not being represented at all by either of the parties when it comes to how, who we all are. Yes. I came here today thinking that my choice was going to be none of the above, but dude, you want me over. <laughs> And a group of Republicans got together with Frank Luntz, including Senator Mitch McConnell, who said that our first priority is to make Obama a one-term president. How are you going to work with those kind of people? Well, as governor of New Mexico, I was constantly asked how I was going to work with the legislature. Well, I have no intention of working with a legislature that's not going to promote everything it is here that I'm talking about. And so I really enjoyed the job as governor of New Mexico. What we want to elect is a leader that's going to simply get up every day and pound away at these, at these issues. Take the debate and the discussion of the American people. Using George Bush as an example. Look, I, I favor privatizing Social Security or parts of it, but there's a real compelling argument that goes along with that. George Bush starts to talk about it. The, the, I would think that water would get boiling on that issue. It doesn't even get to tepid, and he's out of it. That's not, and, and Barack Obama, same thing. Why doesn't he wake up every single morning and start pounding away at the things that we elected him to do? It was, it was, it was wonderful. The things he said was wonderful. There was this hope and this change, and none of it has happened. Hey, Gary, I wanted to say thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Tony Hernandez. And Run for the U.S. Congress in this district. I won the Republican yeah. primary. And I want to say, if you are elected, I would happily and gladly work for the libertarian cause on your picket. Thank you. Thank you. Now, this year in Minnesota, the Republican Party is definitely changing from what they have. We have a whole bunch of candidates, of course. And uh, my question for you is: You know, we do have this two-party system that is dominant. Uh, you know, is there still hope working within the Republican Party, in your opinion? I don't think there is, in my opinion. For all of the uh, head banging that I had, uh, you know, banging my head up against the wall, I just have a bunch of knots in my head. So, libertarian, this is coming out of the closet for me. I think that uh, let's not let's not forget that all of the uh, um, all of the faces on Mount Rushmore were third party candidates at one time. <laughs> Hey Gary, uh, sorry, I uh, think we are changed. Asked you in uh, Tampa about it. Dr. Paul, I think he said he would support him absolutely, but he didn't get the nomination. Uh, when are we going to be expecting Dr. Paul to endorse you for president? Yeah, right. Well, uh, first of all, I, I supported Dr. Paul. Dr. Paul asked for my endorsement in 2008. I readily gave that endorsement. Um, I was asked in the second debate uh, which candidate I would choose as a vice president. That was a no-brainer. That, that's uh, Dr. Paul. When I left the Republican primary, I asked everyone that was going to vote for me to vote for Dr. Paul. I am not asking Dr. Paul for his endorsement. I don't expect his endorsement. I think he's between a rock and a hard place because his son is a U.S. Senator, and I think he 
really is treading lightly on keeping him in that position. Um, do you agree with Ron Paul's views on sound money and would you support a full audit of the Federal Reserve? I would support a full audit of the Federal Reserve. Uh, I, would, uh, I would sign legislation that would repeal legal tender laws, allowing for legislation that would uh, create competing currencies, which would have a basis in sound money. And, and by the way, very, very complex, very complex. But that's why you would have competing currencies. And just for a second, you're going to base you're going to base the currency on a commodity that is going to be market based. So when you go to the gas pump, if it's and, and this is the reason for competing currencies. But if you're going to go to the gas pump and your currency is based on gold and gold is fluctuating in a marketplace as you're buying your debt, you can just see how complex this is. What about an executive order to legalize hemp? Uh, an executive order to legalize hemp? Uh, I have said that I would issue executive orders uh, with regard to um, uh, descheduling marijuana as a class one narcotic. I would not schedule it as a narcotic at all. Uh, and then uh, I would uh, embark on this process of pardons for up to 20 million Americans who have been convicted uh, of felony convictions. I, you're asking me if I can issue an executive order regarding uh, hemp. I don't think I can. If I can, I will. I will. I mean, I make that pledge uh, to you. It's more, it's more of a hemp plant than just marijuana. position, hemp becomes a no-brainer. A no there's, also the, there's also those that are in prison right now. There's also the process of commutation of sentences for the individuals that are behind bars that are there on victimless, non-violent crime. And I view selling drugs as victimless because the seller is just the user who is now thrust into the selling role because the seller has been arrested and is in jail. Would you support the United States issuing a uh, currency from the United States Treasury to, to compete with the other currencies that you would propose? You would always have the dollar, uh, but I, I think the point here is that government is incapable of coming up with, uh, with something as complex as that. And we can just look at Medicaid and Medicare as examples of that. Um, I can't imagine the government being able to tackle this, but if you had competing currencies, um, I think you would have a currency that would emerge. And it would be commodity-based and it would be sound money. It would be a strong U.S. dollar, not a weak U.S. dollar. How do you manage that process of deregulating money, essentially, when other national currencies are based on our currency? I, I hope I made myself clear. This is really complex, really complex. And if you if you go to competing currencies, that's how you that's how you weed out the the, the, the wheat from the chaff. Mr. Johnson, I was wondering what you were planning to do to fix America's broken education system. Broken education system. So. Um, as governor of New Mexico, I was more outspoken than any governor in the country regarding school choice. I, I really think that you need to bring competition to public education. That's my belief. But what's, what's the number one thing that as president of the United States I could do to improve education in this country? It would be to abolish the Federal Department of Education. And let me explain. And let me explain. The federal government gives each state about 11 cents out of every school dollar that every state spends, but it comes with 16 cents worth of strings attached. The federal government says, here's 11 cents, you have to do A, B, C, and D. It costs the state 16 cents to do A, B, C, and D. The Federal Department of Education, established in 1979 under Jimmy Carter, is there anything value added since 1979 when it comes to education from the Federal Department of Education? If we just gave education back to the states, 50 laboratories of innovation and best practice, and they'll actually be better off dollar-wise by not taking federal money. Uh, but if we just give it up to the states, I think we would have some fabulous success that would get emulated. I also think that we would have horrible failure that would get avoided. But if we have 50 laboratories working on best educational practices, we'll have it. As opposed to Washington knows best, Washington top-down has all the answers, 
that's, that's the problem that we have. What's my position on foreign policy? Non-intervention. I, uh, I call for vacating our embassies right now. Why make ourselves a target in the Middle East? We've made so many... I think more and more people are understanding that, we've, that we have become the symbol uh, of, what it, of everything that is wrong in the world. That if we were attacked like we... If, if we were subject to military interventions by other countries, uh, and one of our loved ones died as a result of those military interventions, we would dedicate our own lives to taking revenge against the country that did that. And this is, this is what we've done now for decades, and it's got to stop. Um, sir, going off of that question, what would you do to promote liberty in other countries if we remove our foreign presence with the embassies? notion of we're there to protect vital American interests. Vital American interests are propping up a new dictator in lieu of the old dictator, and after a number of years, guess what? The new dictator isn't any better than the old dictator, only we've propped him up and we're aligned with the new dictator. American interests would be not to be aligned in any decisions that foreign countries should be making for themselves. Let's be the beacon on the hill. Let's adopt marriage equality. Let's end the drug war. Let's let the rest of the world look at America as liberty and freedom and a, and a system that works to promote individuals and individuals as to how hard they're going to work, entrepreneurs, sound money. You, uh, you say that you agree with a lot of things, um, with Obama on a lot of things right now, right? I agree with what he has to say. Yeah, yeah but he's trying to get things done, especially with when you have a lot of people in your own government working against you. A one-term presidency isn't going to be enough. First term is setting up the dominoes, the second term is knocking them all down. You're basically taking away the guy's chance, so shouldn't we save your breath for the next term? I gotta tell you, I served two terms as governor of New Mexico, and I have the opposite experience. You can, you can push the envelope just as far as you possibly can. The good government was easy. It started out with taking on the issues every single day and making politics non-existent in the equation. Issues first, politics last. No, I reject that completely. As governor of New Mexico, I took on the issues every single day. Every single day for four straight years, politics be damned. Science debate 2012? No. No. The crux of it is how will we ensure that science um, is incorporated into transparent and notorious policy regulations? and stay in tune with that going forward, but I, I don't want to check out sense of it. it makes all the sense in the world, but I, I don't want to. President Obama and Mitt Romney both responded to the looking for And if they said, if they, if, I, I, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure they responded to the, <laughs> to the question. <laughs> but it, I want to say, I'm 42 years old, we have never had a better presidential candidate. gee, this is going to guide me going forward, it was just coming, uh, her putting into words that the biggest contribution that I can make to society is to be the best that I can possibly be. By, by being the best that I can possibly be, that's how I positively affect other people's lives. Uh, I'm going to end this right now by, by saying the following. Uh, we're doing a 40-campus tour across the country. Myself, uh, Judge Jim Gray is my vice presidential candidate. He's doing 20 colleges and universities, me 20 colleges and universities. Why are we targeting co colleges and universities? Because you as young people are getting screwed. I'm going to retire, I'm going to have health care, but you 
are never going to be able to retire, you're never going to be able to quit work, and there will not be health care available to you. President Obama passes his health care plan. This is a plan that is incumbent on healthy people paying for those that aren't so healthy. That burden falls on you. Our military intervention, this burden falls on you. Revolt, revolt, make a difference. Thank you very much.